like incredibly excited to be hosting or uh, moderating the the second panel of EPI uh, 2020 online. Uh, it's been a really you know, dynamic program so far. We launched on Monday night with a fantastic panel discussion by young <coughs> African art professionals. Uh, we've had, you know, we have an ongoing, very fascinating and incredible exhibition happening online. We've got a program of studio visits that you can book for with the, the finalists in the Emerging Painting Invitational. And uh, so things are moving and grooving. We had a masterclass with two uh, remarkable painters. It's, it's happening. Just, and in fact, um, uh, being forced uh, to move the, the project online has given us an incredible opportunity to uh, have these conversations with uh, uh, wonderful professionals across the world, which we couldn't have even hoped for uh, gathering in one place at one oh. time, because uh, normally all of you guys would have been traveling and jet setting all over the world. And it's, uh, so I, I feel particularly privileged uh, this evening to introduce, uh, to introduce the panel building uh, uh, career for African artists abroad and on the continent. And we've got, and the way this, this panel was uh, conceived is to actually bring together, uh, you know, really dynamic professionals in, you know, who are involved in uh, different sectors of the industry with an opportunity, with an overview and an insight into uh, giving young artists an opportunity to form a more holistic picture of how their profession operates, because often it is very difficult for a young artist to actually come to grips with, you know, the whole structure of this quite a complicated industry, which doesn't work like any other. So with this in mind, I would like to introduce uh, uh, our wonderful guests. We have with us Mihaly Solomon, who is the co-founder of uh, Prison Miami, uh, uh, you know, an, an incredible art fair that takes place uh, live in, in December in Miami every year except this. Uh, wave hello, Michele. <laughs> and who's joining us from Miami today. Then we have the wonderful Sabrina Amrani, who is uh, the founder of uh, Sabrina Amrani Gallery, who's based in uh, Madrid, but who grew up in Paris and uh, who's in fact Algerian, so she's African, like us. Um, then we have Susie Goodman, who is the executive director of uh, uh, Strauss and Co, our very wonderful sponsors and hosts this evening. And, uh, and last but not least, uh, we have the amazing and incredible Ernestine White, who is the executive director of the, the WHAG gallery the, in the Kimberleys, which is, as we've just, uh, we recently found out is a, the best museum in South Africa. And so we are extremely privileged to have all of you with us tonight. And without, you know, and Arisha will just tell me, brief, Arisha, the wonderful Arisha who is, uh, has been the, the technical whiz behind everything uh, uh, so far this week can indicate that if we can uh, start the discussion, if there, if we have enough people who've been in the room that we can, Arisha, can you tell me? <laughs> um, yeah, so far everybody's in, we've got about 35 people online um, and this is being recorded. So if there is any disruptions and if anybody has any technical issues, it's being recorded on my side and we will upload it. Um, and for anybody that can't make it. So I think we are good to start. Brilliant. So welcome everybody again. I would also just uh, logistically, I'm a huge fan of informal conversations, but also uh, q and A. I I would, so everyone who's joined us in the audience, can you please be posting your questions to specific panelists or in general uh, as we go along, because it gives us an idea and I think it makes for a much better discussion. With this in mind, I've asked all of our panelists 
tonight to comment briefly on what they feel are the biggest uh, challenges, but also the opportunities for emerging artists entering, you know, entering the profession of, of an artist. You know? So I'll just, I'll just, from their perspective, and also from the, with the idea of what, uh, I guess, and with a comment on what they're doing and uh, prospectively in the future that will have an impact for emerging artists on the continent in particular. So Ernest, let's start with you, Ernestine. All right. Um, uh, thanks once again, Verily. Um, I am the director of the William Humphreys Art Gallery, which is a national museum in um, Kimberley, Northern Cape, South Africa. And um, so to start off with the two questions that you posed to us, Valerie, and in my opinion, um, what I've, I've experienced is the, the challenges that I, I see emerging artists experiencing is financial stability, that's the first. And I think because from that standpoint, the rest of the challenges kind of um, are, are aligned. So the issue of professionalism, closely aligned with financial stability. If you don't have money to um, really, you know, buy the best uh, materials to present your work in its best light, whether it's, you know, as in frames or even on online, um, that all spirals into your inability to be exposed um, and then appreciated to the best of, of your ability. So, for example, as an institution um, that is aligned with government, we're funded by national government. When I engage with artists, emerging artists, and they have this view that they can rock up with the artworks to the museum and I'll be available for them, um, I must look at the work and I must buy. And um, there, is no, there is no understanding that it's the structure that I work in is very different than a commercial gallery where I can't just open up a checkbook and buy at the instance of you presenting something to me at the door. It is a process that, inquire, that requires a collective decision by a committee of people. Um, the work is reviewed, considered. We as management present um, the works to a committee, motivate why it should be in the collection. Um, we look at our collection, what's missing, what's needed, and then kind of make a decision as to, okay, your work would, be, would fit into a particular area that's missing. Um, and then that process continues with at least two or three other uh, forms of approval. And, but it doesn't even end there. Before we can even consider acquiring your work, you have to be tax compliant. Um, artists, don't, a lot of them don't pay the tax. So how do you become tax compliant? How do you get onto a database called the Central Supplier Database, the CSD? Because only once you are on the database, can I even think about acquiring your work? No matter how amazing it is, if you're not on the database, I can't acquire your work. But artists also don't understand the advantage of being on that database. It means that any organization aligned to government will easily be able to buy your work without stressing. But if you are not on that database, you are unknown to us. So it's really about, you know, trying to have artists understand this complex structure that is, is a very, um, it is complicated in the processes of approval. And then the final saying, yes, once you've gone through all those hoops, we have purchased your work. Um, so for me, the first thing is really about understanding that a lot of artists struggle. And in particular, a space like Northern Cape, unemployment is high. And again, how do I assist you to understand that you must be able to present your work in its best light? Um, and then in the other question about um, 
what are the advantages? Um, I, I think what's really been amazing is there's this growing interest, whether it's national or global, but more global than anything else, a global interest in, in the works by artists from the African continent. So that opens up so many opportunities, art fairs across the globe, um, in addition to, to auction houses. But I think um, I'd like to pose a few questions to Susie when we get to her with regards to the secondary market, because there's been an internal discussion um, in institutions as to um, why is there no ability for artists whose work through the secondary market increase in value? Why are they not able to um, uh, be given a percentage of, of those sales. So a work that was bought in 1950 for $200 and in, in 2020, 400,000 or 2 million by, and I know it's gone through many owners. Is there a possibility for that secondary market to provide that kind of cushion for artists who, although they could possibly be well known, but well known in, in name, but struggling in reality. And that secondary market possibly being an important um, uh, cushion to assist them to really get to a level where they're able to be financially stable. Um, I think I'll leave it at that for now. Awesome. Awesome. I'm going to I'm going to turn now to Michaeli and I, I want you to comment. So uh, as I mentioned, uh, PRISM was founded in 2013 at the same time as, I guess, 150 Forge. We kind of benchmark as the, the I guess, the, the start of the very major public international presence for contemporary African art. Would you be able to, like, answer the questions, but also give us a little bit of an insight on the trajectory of how you see this development, like the history, like the, of the past seven years. Yes, so, so thank you for um, inviting me to um, speak with you this afternoon, um, Valerie. Um, so to, to answer your questions about the challenges and the advantages of, um, I guess, the current climate, um, I think one of the, the challenges um, having not, uh, I graduated from school not too long ago. <laughs> like I, I would say maybe about uh, maybe 10 years ago myself um, as from, from an artistic practice as well. Um, and one of the, probably one of the, I guess, foundational issues is that universities don't necessarily emphasize professional practice um, for, for fine artists or um, um, practitioners in the creative space. So, from the outset, you have you have um, practitioners with immense talent, um, and their talents are focused on, of course, building their practices, um, spending time generating um, their practices. But when it comes to actually being able to professionally manage their practice, because quite frankly, this is this is a business um, when you when you really boil down to it. Um, when you get into the nuts and bolts, ultimately, it, it becomes it becomes a, a means by which you, you're making a living. So you have to treat it as such. Um, and um, perhaps universities don't do um, uh, diligence to, to students uh, by giving them or, or creating programs that where they can actually develop their practice, but then also understand what is expected of them when they do enter the market. Um, how to things like, as Ernestine made the point, you know, being able to register yourself as an entity and be, being 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 um, acknowledged tax wise. I mean, that's a very that's a very simple thing um, that you know any anybody who's managing themselves professionally should know. Um, being able to manage your books, um, the understanding of profit and loss statement, all those things are a part of what you will be responsible for. Um, when you do decide to um, have a, a, a burgeoning practice. Um, so I think that that's an immediate challenge that perhaps the foundational part of becoming an artist does not, does not offer. 
um, artist just yet. Um, and then I would say the advantages are that um, we are, especially right now in this moment, having to come to grips with the fact that we do have to communicate with each other um, via the internet. But I think the internet provides us with a, a vast amount of opportunity. Um, you know, Valerie, I'm here speaking with you today and I was, I've never, I'd never done that prior to just two weeks ago. Um, um, and so the limitation of us traveling, um, we were limited to, by, by us traveling to each other, but this moment has made us really rethink how we can actually use technology to connect with each other. Um, and I've had the opportunity to uh, work with galleries I wasn't able to work with before um, because of the limitations of the logistics of getting work from one from one part of the world to another, um, which is a which is a massive expense. And sometimes galleries um, might not be at the place just yet financially where they can incur those costs. Um, so I think there's a beauty, there's a, a subtle beauty. I say subtle because there's still a lot of a lot of challenges that come with the moment that we're in. But there are there are subtle um, subtle advantages that I think could actually bring us much closer together. And then on the on the opposite side of everything that's happening, we have we've built connections that can that can be um, emboldened in the future. Um, and then the work of Prism is largely we created Prism specifically to address the paucity of um, of a representation of di diaspora and African artists um, in the market. Um, I understood that I had I had friends who were themselves talented creatives that didn't really know how to insert themselves, and we I just thought of Prism as an opportunity to do that. Um, and um, we've been able to con con contextualize artist practices through our through our space, um, and we've been able to connect artists to institutions. Um, we've had artists, for instance, who um, after working with us, went on to do major museum shows um, in Miami um, or in New York. Some of them were in the Whitney Biennale. Um, some have been in Prospect, which is essentially the United States version of, of a Biennale um, in New Orleans. Um, so I like to think of PRISM as a, a pipeline for um, burgeoning artists. Um, and um, I think we do a, a, an exemplary job at connecting even emerging galleries to the larger global conversation. Thanks so much, Mihaly. I'm going to turn now to Sabrina. And so I think both Ernestine and uh, Mihaly were speaking um, a lot about, you know, professionalism and uh, becoming a business. But at the same time, there needs to be a balance, you know, because you're dealing with young artists who need to make a living from their art. But at the same time, as a, as a gallerist, you know, you would also be aware of some of the, the importance of balancing that with the creative practice and, and balancing that with, you know, with, uh, with focus. I mean, so how, you know, how would you answer these questions working at the coal face actually of dealing with artists, you know, and growing their careers, but also seeing their careers over over time. Well, it's a tricky question, but uh, yes, of course, we don't have to forget that um, we are talking here about market and business. Being a professional uh, artist, it means uh, also being an entrepreneur, and you can be uh, a very good artist and a very bad entrepreneur. So that's why also you need key people mm -hmm. to. <laughs> next to you to, to help you navigate this world. Um, <clears throat> I think, um, I mean, for an artist, uh, I like to say that art never dies. If you are an artist, you will find your ways to create whatever is your context, whatever are your struggles. Uh, then working as a professional artist, it's a lot of uh, ingredients that you have to add to your good art in a way. Um, 
to be it's not easy but i don't know if we, if we are going too fast in the conversation but um being a professional artist and being in the market um i think artists learn how to to play within this within this market and and there is a, st a certain limit of course um uh, if if i would have to go to the ground and uh, and think about uh, a nice advice is uh, do art that you consider that you consider is true to yourself do not fail uh, do not fall sorry into uh, into the market um, <laughs> into the market game um, so that's that that's what I, I would advise um, I'm not sure if I answer your question, Valérie, but... So, no, I mean, I think what is the, the... what is I think that you raise a very important point, especially because you're sitting with fairly minimal artworks behind you at, at a mm -hmm. time when... And, and at a time when, you know, the art market is jumping up and down about figuration, right? So I think this is... This is a, it's a very crucial moment, right? Uh, yeah. It's a very crucial moment because uh, we're dealing with a situation in the art market, especially for young contemporary art artists who, you know, they feel the pressure to make a living, right, and make a living right now, and they don't have, may not have the confidence to feel that, uh, you know, to feel that they, you know, they can, because to work, integrity will cost you being hungry in the present moment, right? And and so so I think I would like you to talk more about the role of the galleries in that sense, you know, on how to like, because uh, Michele and Ernestine spoke about building up professionalism, and you said that you need good people by your side. I'm I'm all I'm like you, I'm more of a fan of saying, uh, if you find the right gallerist, then this is what they should, you know, what might be the expectations that the artist should have of a gallerist, right? Because you're, you're a really good model of a gallerist that works extremely hard and does a good job, like seriously, and helps maintain, make sure that their artists are able to maintain integrity of their process and their work. So what would you suggest that artists would do and also to make sure their creativity is not sacrificed? Well, as Mikelin said, in fact, uh, um, and, and as I said before, it's important to be well uh, in good company. So what to expect from your gallery, um, especially in, in that moment uh, with a very global interest in African artists. Uh, African art is right now very hot on the market. Um, but this has um, some uh, tricks in, in being in that moment. Uh, you need to find the right partner for you that will understand your work, the galleries that will understand your work, that will understand your message and that will respect it and that will uh, share it um, with the most respect uh, to the audience. Um, I like to say that the, there is a, a huge responsibility on the part of, uh, of the galleries. And, they, and also I'm, I'm talking from, from Madrid so I am not in Africa. Uh, I am not, I work, uh, I have uh, two African artists behind me, uh, but I am presenting them to uh, a Euro European audience here and uh, online, which is a global audience. So I have always to be very careful on, on how I am presenting them. Uh, is it the same to show um, a woman veiled uh, in Europe uh, or is it the same to show it in Saudi Arabia, for example? Of course not. So my, my job is also to be sure that I am explaining very well. So I think here it's very important. How do you connect with your galleries? But they, I think a lot of artists are, are, are looking for the, the answer. Well, um, it's unfortunately, uh, though it's a market, it's a very human, human market uh, in the sense that um, the artists I work with, sometimes, I mean, many times it took me three years before we start working together. It's an encounter. We like, I like his work. Then it's 
most of the time, and I would say always in my sense, a relationship between two persons. I, I need really to connect with the artist. It's a relationship that, that is based on trust. He will trust in me. Uh, he will uh, give me his work and, uh, and I will uh, protect it and custody it uh, until it goes to the end of uh, the institution of the collector. And, uh, and there, is, there is so many good artists and uh, there is a, so few artists I can work with because uh, I am also a human gallery. So um, there is uh, here, I, I would say that artists should um, make the best of their, of their effort, not only into creating work, but also in, in meeting people and connecting with people. And uh, here the human connection is the most uh, important. Can I add to that, um, um, to what Sabrina is saying, because I think uh, artists also need to understand the difference between being independent and being with a gallery. Um, what are the disadvantages and the advantages? So for example, in my space, because I work with people who are in government, who don't understand the art world. Um, and when I say this artist is represented by this gallery, and the question is, how much is the artist getting um, why must we go to the gallery? Why can't we go to the artist directly? Um, um, surely we will get it cheaper if we go to the artist. And there's, there's a lack of understanding the ecosystem of ethics, where if an artist has a gallery, you go to the gallerist. Uh, and um, and I think also, you know, a, a question or not a question, a conversation that is never um, one that is um, being engaged with enough, especially on, on the African continent, is the idea of diversity and representation. So um, a lot of galleries are owned by white individuals. Um, there's less than a handful of, of gallery owners who are black, who are non-white in the in South Africa. So what does that mean? What are the challenges of individuals who want to have or create galleries? Um, what are the challenges they are experiencing? And again, from someone that comes from an institution where individuals who um, I report to want to acquire works by, for example, only black galleries. When I tell them there's less than a handful of them. I mean, this this is a really huge point. I mean, the this is this is something that we addressed on Monday night, which is why we had a panel discussion with the young African professionals because we want, and I think it's a it's a concern also for context, but also I think this would be a good opportunity to even speak to turn to Susie. Am I still with everyone? Yes. Yes, yeah. you are. <laughs> For two, re for two reasons. Uh, one being that, uh, of course, to address the question of the longevity and sustainability, but also uh, not just the diversity of, uh, of the owners of galleries, which is, I think it's a big problem, right? But also the diversity of the collector base, right? And I think Susie can comment a little bit on, on what has you know in her experience also what she's seeing in terms of like of strauss collector base right because one of the key critical issues for me as well as somebody who's been analyzing this this the development of african contemporary art is the fact that it's it's a it's a vulnerable market in a sense that uh, we haven't you know so much of the support for and the collector base for the work of contemporary artists on the continent is actually outside the continent, which makes it vulnerable to changes in fashion, uh, you know, because young artists often, uh, I mean, are not aware that, you know, the international uh, art market is a, is a creature of fashion that it moves change, you know, it moves across different regions. Sometimes this region is hot. So, there needs to be uh, 
they, you know, there needs to be a recognition. So of, uh, a sustainability has to be built up from within. So like Susie, can you comment on that? Yeah, sure. I'd be delighted. Thank you for being here. I mean, for having me. Um, it's a, a fantastic to be able to talk on these issues. And um, firstly, maybe just to quickly say from the secondary market perspective of an auction house, obviously we're not a gallery and we're not responsible for the building of the artist's career like um, Sabrina and Michele have so rightly said. We are very much, once the artwork has been bought from a gallery and it sits in a collector's collection, or, or, is in, or in a corporate collection, and then those collections then start to be changed or diversified, we then get the artwork that comes to us and we then put it on the market and sell it. So I think it's important for, for, for young emerging artists to realize that there is a difference. We don't develop artists' careers, um, but from our perspective, the thing that is imperative for us and the longevity of an artist's career is your records. I know Philippa Duncan mentioned that in the comments earlier, it is absolutely imperative that you document what you sell, you photograph it, you invoice it, you have a clear record of who bought things because the once you sell things and you forget about it, you might not think it's relevant, but obviously if the work comes back to the secondary market 20 years later, those archives are absolutely relevant and, and where who sold it to and who had it or which exhibition your work went on or which group show you were involved in, all of that information becomes incredibly important for your profile, your perspective, your pricing. Um, but in terms of the development of the buyer, I think that's one thing that is a huge advantage of your work being in the secondary market is that you're exposed to different buyers. So obviously Sabrina's network, for example, is, is, is X, Y, and Z, you go to X, Y, and Z fairs, but often the secondary market can add another component of buyers who are coming from a different area. And I think that's something that is, is, is really relevant and, and your presence within that secondary market visibility, your profile on the social media, Instagram, as, as Sabrina mentioned earlier, is, is important. Um, I think when you come to talking about the new people, who collectors who are coming into the market, we have seen in the last three years, a tremendous increase in new collectors um, who are particularly interested in, in work from the continent and it's exciting. Um, and I think um, the power of the auction house is that we can also tap into international networks. So we can find buyers, yes, out of, out of the continent, but maybe who have roots here or who are from the continent and then obviously buy art, buying artworks from, on our sales of these artists, then increase their profile because they sell well, there's a demand for them, we get more works because the prices have increased. Um, but that is exciting. I mean, I think we've always consciously been aware of the size of the continent. And it's often difficult to get works from Nairobi to be auctioned in Johannesburg. And the markets have been quite separate because of the size of, of the geographical distances. But definitely online, the whole development of online sales, online markets has completely broken down those geographical barriers. Um, but maybe one other point to add about the development of the buyer is that the more information that we can give about what exhibition the artists have been on, who their galleries are, where they've been represented, the more confidence that you can give to potential buyers to buy maybe an artist they don't really know. Um, and I think an auction also has that benefit is that you can put a young, uh, a young artist whose work is coming to the auction for the first time um, having sold well within the gallery space or on art fair, and they're sitting in the same space as some of the well-established artists who um, whose records are there, who have a long history, who have well-established markets uh, prices in the secondary market, and that can be a really nice complement to 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 a sort of lesser-known artist that is coming to the secondary market for the first time. Can you also address maybe Ernestine's question about the artist resale royalty? Yeah, yeah, sure. So, so you were you were discussing earlier is basically is a law that was actually introduced uh, in France um, after World War One, uh, and it's a beautiful it's a beautiful story. Uh, like I think the origin of the law of artist resale royalty is a beautiful story because a lot of artists were motivated so passionately by uh, you know by idealism and they volunteered to go to war and also Spanish Civil War and. Uh, and they and and they died. A lot of artists died in that war. And what has happened is that there was a groundswell of, of, of belief that their 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 widows needed to be supported. And the only way they could be supported was through sales, through some kind of return on sales of their works in other people's collections. And that was the origin of the artist retail uh, resale royalty. And people have been. I think there's one. And correct me if I'm wrong, Mihaly. 
I think there's one in um, uh, there, 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 there is an artist resale royalty in California. I believe so, but it, yeah, it, it was. I think it may have been contested, though. I think um, there's been a lot of fighting, infighting around the legalities or royalties um, paid to artists in the U.S. And I think a lot of people have been trying to strike it down, uh, but it's still they're still clamoring over over the idea. And I think they tried to introduce. I think in the uh, I think it, there is some there are some laws across the EU, and they and uh, and the London became uh, kind of an art world center for a while because it has res the UK government has resisted it. Uh, what is the situation in South Africa? So absolutely, the artist's resale rights has gone to. Um, it's actually been it's a draft legislation. It's been, it is being contested at the moment because of the ability to collect the licensing royalty. So if you use an image or obviously if you sell work and you have to collect the royalties, that's where the issue at the moment is because the, the, there's no central organization that is being put forward to collect the royalties and how the royalties will be collected and how they'll be dispersed. And I think there's been a concern about protecting that money and making sure that it actually does go to the artist or the artist's family rather than ch chunks of money being used for administrative costs. So uh, it, it is very much in the draft stage. I, I mean, we're very involved in it. Um, and we are very, obviously, as an auction house, are very um, cognitive of, of that, the need to support the communities, um, or well, the artist and, and the community around them, their families. Um, one of the other aspects that's very important is that, obviously, image rights if, if, if an artist is imaged to Delro, obviously we've been very good at making sure that those images are paid, but they can also be a disadvantage because maybe an organization that maybe doesn't have the opportunity or the funding will then not sometimes use the image of that artwork because they've got to pay an amount and they will tend to then use another artist's image in, in, in its place because of cost factors. And that sometimes can be a disadvantage for the artist because then their visibility in the printed world or the magazines or et cetera, where they were used to be advertised, then that goes down. And so their visibility in the market becomes lower. And as we all know, visibility of artists, whether it's profile on Instagram or it's exhibition, whatever it is, your visibility and being seen is absolutely imperative. So I think it's trying to find that balance. I think obviously within the South African context, there are other aspects, they're putting everything together, the music rights, the artist rights. So it's, it is a very complicated field and, 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 and it is, it is, it's being challenged on a number of areas. Um, so I think uh, for us as an auction house, we, we also feel very passionate about putting money to actually supporting artists within the educational aspect. So young artists emerging like this or artists at Artist Proof Studio actually, you know, supporting a bursary or giving the opportunity to a young artist to do a tertiary, you know, arts degree, for example. We, we're very much trying to put support there too, that it's actually tangible for an art student to either be involved in the art market or to try and, you know, to give them an artist residency, you know, just actually support where needed right at the beginning of an artist's career. But it, yeah, it's, it, is, it is very pertinent to our market. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. I think it's uh, it's I think it's really critical. I, Ernestine, did did that did Susie address the the question that you want that you asked earlier on? Um, a little bit. I mean, I know it's a complicated issue. It's not cut and dry to say you know if you um, sell an artwork for two million, then you know twenty thousand goes to an artist. Um, mm -hmm. But it is, it is a reality, I think, that unfortunately in South Africa, we have far too many starving artists. When um, I've had a, an opportunity to be at a Strauss and Co. auction and being shocked at the volume of money that is spent within less than five minutes um, and realizing none of it is going to the artist. And knowing some of those artists are literally struggling um, and seeing someone who has a lot continue to have a lot. Um, so, you know, it's, 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 it's saddening that that is a reality. And I know it's, you know, expecting one market to take care of artists is also not fair but there has to be a balance between how do we make um, the resale part of that ecosystem to ensure that artists are 
continuing to survive and producing work to put into the, the ecosystem that then, you know. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a complicated issue that I know needs to be dealt with on so many levels from, you know, the sector itself, then to legislation, if it even gets to that level. Um, yeah, I don't know where. I think there's, where... One point that's, there's one aspect that is important, particularly for this platform where there are a lot of young emerging artists who are listening to our advice for the market, is that remember the auction house, we don't, we, the, we don't, that money that you say that you saw being sold in that five minutes that rocketed through the roof, obviously we don't pocket that, we pocket a commission. Yes, I know. <laughs> so it's important for the artist to know that, you know, you see an artwork selling for five million rand, Strauss, that's not Strauss's money. Exactly. Um, I, think, yes. I think that the important thing to highlight here is that for the artists who, you know, are in this predicament that is you know, we're all very cognitive of it, um, that there's this inequality and this, and a lot of artists who are struggling. I think it's also really interesting to look at some of the artists that are doing well and that that people are, for example, the artists, you know, that, that are very, people are collecting at the moment is the importance of what we are talking about in the professional practice. Yeah. Is that, you know, there is literature, there was exhibitions, there is academic yeah backbone by the fact that these prices have reached these markets because the artist was represented was well maybe not put at the moment but uh, if, if you look at the cross the, those examples is to make sure that these professional practices help emerging artists to get themselves established with the academic and, and I would and like I, I would like to, to step in because uh, I mean uh, uh, as a gallerist I, I collaborate uh, I work with uh, I mean, it's an ecosystem, so we all work together at some point. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> but um, I would like to react to what uh, Suzy said and, and what we are talking about. I would like to remind that for an emerging artist, the, f the finality, the goal is not to arrive to an auction. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I'm, I'm very uh, respectful of, uh, mm -hmm. of uh, the function of the auction houses. But I really want to remind that for an emerging artist, first he has to work before on the primary market. And I make sure that uh, on my side, as much as I can, that my artists do not arrive to secondary market. So this is also part of my job. So, the, and also I wanted to, to answer to Ernestine because Ernestine, uh, before uh, she asked me, she asked if I could talk maybe a little more about the role of the gallery, uh, and I didn't have the chance to to answer to that. But uh, as a gallerist, uh, apart from uh, really taking care of uh, of my artists and being sure that I am selling, placing works with certain collectors that uh, they love the work and they will not uh, send it uh, to auction. I hope in the next 20 years, of course it can happen, but I'm, it's, this is, these are really serious conversation that we have with other collectors um, to be sure what, if they love the work and why they are buying the work, because there is a lot of speculation, which is another huge problem right now around African art. But uh, as part of my job as a gallerist is also to promote and to, uh, place the artist within institution, within certain collectors, within, uh, with patrons, within patrons' house, uh, to be sure that they will um, really make uh, the artist's life more sustainable in a way. And this is what a museum can do when a, a museum um, acquire work. It, uh, in a way, confirm and, uh, and be a custodian for a very long time of this, uh, of this artist. And this is also a way to, that help to build a career. But it, how to build a career, because what, that's where the topic is about. <clears throat> it's not building a career in an auction house. And, and I'm very sorry to, to say it frankly. But you said also, Susie, you said we are not gallerists. And you, you were very clear on that. You're absolutely right. We, we're, not, we're not gallerists. We don't build the artist's career. Absolutely. I, I said that at the beginning. We, we get artwork 20 years later. Absolutely. Or, you know, we but, don't get work fresh out of a studio. I, I completely agree with you. Too. Sorry, sorry, to do, uh, can I ask me, because we're getting, getting emotional, which is fantastic, because this is a very <laughs> But Michaeli, can you please yeah. comment, how do you feel about the current sort of hype and speculation on, for African contemporary artists? Because I think, 
I think uh, Sabrina made an important point. A lot of young artists uh, that we encounter, they expect, you know, they do arrive at 25 and they expect to be, you know, having a big house, driving a big car within three years of, of their career. And, and I often have to sit people down and say, look, you will be making art until you are 112 because oh, right. how long artists tend to live. Do you really right. think you made your best work at 25? And if you right. have, that is very scary, right? Mm -hmm. But right now, uh, art, thanks to the American market, so you are our representative American, <laughs> is caught up in this cult of celebrity, right? Mm -hmm. Which is also very new for, for art, right? Mm -hmm. And and it introduces a lot of disruptive elements that are very, you know, seductive, like they're seductive for young artists. So how do you feel about this? Because it also is involved, you know, you have you have your Swiss beats, you have your yeah. J, mm -hmm. and you yeah. have you know, uh, yeah. Love Daddy buying stuff at auction and all of a sudden, mm -hmm. and, and it is, you know, it, you know, this integration is becomes, becomes a yeah. moment. Well, I mean, I, I want to preface this by saying I feel I feel I feel like it's so wrong to say that like African art is just now having a moment. I think it's probably having a focus. There's focused attention on it, but I think that its importance has always been there. It was just perhaps undervalued and under recognized. Um, but I think it's always been an important part of it's just the canon just refused to <laughs> to acknowledge it. And, and now we're doing it in a more poignant and salient way. Um, and I hope it is just, I hope it's not a moment. I hope it is um, a sustainable um, and a necessary part of the, of the continued conversation in the art market. Um, but I would say that, I mean, pop culture has a way of sort of, <laughs> of, sort of transforming things and, um, and adding, adding a, an element of, of interest. But I think the, um, the important thing is that diversity is, is the important part of how we, how we move forward. Um, Ernestine mentioned diversity.